Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session. Today we're looking at part two of If You Know Not Me, You Know Not Anybody, part two. Yes, we're looking at scenes six through ten of this play by Thomas Haywood, written about 1605. We had a look at the first five scenes yesterday, which were very much involved with various levels of London business. A man called Gresham tried to gain a monopoly on sugar, scolded his nephew, resolved a dispute with another man called Ramsay, got a man called Hobson to give the nephew a job in France so he would stop being such a wastrel. Meanwhile, the nephew, whose name is John, has run off with a hundred pounds and gotten a Puritan arrested. So lots of fun will ensue, we presume. As usual, we're joined by an eclectic and awesome company of volunteer readers uh, who will introduce themselves. This afternoon, uh, reading Ramsey, Tawny Coat, and Factor, we have... That's me, Leo, <laughs> and I'm in Bristol. <laughs> Reading Clown, Sheriff, and Ambassador. Me and I'm Bryony in Lincolnshire. Reading Nimble Chaps, Workman, and Mariner. Rachel Nicole, actor on the East Coast. Reading Quick, Swordbearer, and Boy. Lynn, I live in the Northwestern United States, and this is Scooter. He says hi. He's sleeping. <laughs> Reading Lady Ramsay, Crack, and Lord Number Two. Hi, my name's Elizabeth the Misu, and I'm an author based in Romford. Reading Hobson and Lord Number One. One based in Suffolk. Reading Gresham. At Lois in London. And finally, reading Dr. Noel, Persuivant and Interpreter. Hi, I'm Eric, and I'm coming to you from an unknown location, but I mean, when, when I say unknown, it's unknown to me, not to you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Aliki Chapel, your temporary host, reading stage directions and attempting to keep an eye on the time. So here we go, beginning with scene six, enter Dr. Noel Gresham, Sir Thomas Ramsay, Hobson, and Lady Ramsay. Come, Master Dr. Noel. Now we have done our worst to your good cheer. We'd fain be gone. Um, only we stay my kinsman's long return to pay this hundred pound to Sir Thomas Ramsay. Then assure you he will be he here presently. In the meantime, I have drawn you to this walk, a gallery wherein I keep the pictures of many charitable citizens, that having fully satisfied your bodies, you may by them learn to refresh your souls. Ah, are all these pictures of good citizens? They are, and I'll describe to you some of their births, how they are bestowed, how they bestowed their lives and did so live. The fruits of this life might a better give. Huh. You shall gain more in showing this to us than you have shown. Good Master Dean, I pray you show it us. This was the picture of Sir John Philippot, sometime mayor. This man at one time in his own charge levied 10,000 soldiers, guarded, guarded the realm from the incursions of our enemies. And in the year 1380, when Thomas of Woodstock, Thomas Percy, with other noblemen, were lent to aid the Duke of Brittany, this said, um, John Philipot, Philpot furnished out four ships at his own charges and did release the armor that the poor soldiers had for victuals pawned. This man did live when Walworth was Lord Mayor, that provident, valiant, and learned citizen that both attached and killed that traitor Tyler, for which good service, Walworth, the Lord Mayor, this Philpot and four other aldermen were knighted in the field. Thus he did live, and yet, before he died, assured relief for thirteen poor forever. By the merry God, a worthy citizen, uh, on, good my dean. This, Sir Richard Whittington, three times mayor, son to a knight and apprentice to a mercer, began the library of Greyfriars in London, 
and his executors after him did build Whittington College, 13 almshouses for poor men, repaired St. Bartholomew's in Smithfield, glazed the, gu- the guild hall, and built Newgate. Don't to me, that I've heard lies. I'd heard he was a scullion and raised himself by venture of a cat. They did the more wrong to the gentleman. <laughs> This Sir John Allen, mercer and mayor of London, a man so grave of life that he was made a privy councillor to King Henry VIII. He gave this city a rich colour of gold that by the mayor succeeding should be worn, of which Sir William Maxton was the first, and is continued even unto this year. A number more there are of whose good deeds the city flourished. And we may be ashamed, for in their deeds we see our own disgrace. We, that are citizens, are rich as they were. Behold their charity in every street, churches for prayer, almshouses for the poor, condits which bring us water, all which good we do see and are relieved withal. And yet we live like beasts, spend time and die, leaving no good to be, to be remembered by. Among the stories of these blessed men, so many that enrich your gallery, there are two women's pictures. What were they? They are two that have deserved a memory worthy of note of our posterity. This Agnes Foster, a wife to Sir John A. Foster, that uh, freed a beggar at the Great of Ludgate, was after mayor of this most famous city, and builded the south side of Ludgate up, upon which wall these verses I have read. Devout souls that pass this way, for master or foster late mayor honestly pray, and Agnes' his wife to God consecrate, at of pity this house made for Londoners in Ludgate, so that for lodging and water here nothing they pay, as their keepers shall answer at dreadful doomsday. Oh, what a charitable deed was this! This? Ave Gibson, who in her husband's life, being a grocer and a sheriff of London, founded a free school at Ratcliffe, there to instruct threescore poor children, built 14 almshouses for 14 poor, leaving for tutors 50 pound a year, and quarterly for everyone a noble. Why should not I live so? That being dead, my name might have registered with theirs. Why should not all of us? being wealthy men, and by God's blessing only raised, but cast in our minds how we might them exceed in godly works, helping of them that need. Own to me, tis true. Why should we live to have the poor to curse us being dead? Heaven grant that I may live, that when I die, although my children laugh, the poor may cry. If... You will follow the religious path that these have beat best that these have beat before you. You shall win heaven. Even in the midday walks, you shall not walk the street, but widows' orisons, Lazar's prayers, orphans' thanks will fly into your ears and with a joyful blush make you thank God that you have done for them. When otherwise they'll fill your ears with curses, crying, We feed on woe, you are our nurses. Oh, tis is not better than that cup, young couple say, you raised us up, then you were our decay. <laughs> and mother's tongues teach their firstborn to sing of your good deeds, than by your bad to ring. No more, Master Dr. Nowell, no more. I think these words should make a man of flint to mend his life. How say you, Master Gresham? <laughs> For God, they have started tears into my eyes. And, Master Dr. Noel, you shall see, the words that you have spoke have wrought effect in me. And from these women I will take away, to guide my life for a more blessed stay. Begin then, whilst you live, lest being dead the good you give in charge be never done. Make your own hands your executors, your eyes overseers, and have this saying ever in your mind. Women be forgetful, children be unkind, executors be covetous, and take what they can find. By time, I've seen many of them. I'll learn then to prevent them while I live. The good I mean to do, these hands shall give. Enter quick. The matter you want of is done, sir. A done? Nay, what is done? 
he's in Huckster's handling, sir, and here he commends him unto you. Marry God, knave, just tell me riddles, what's all this? A thing will speak his own mind to you, if you please but open the lip. Enter clown. I leave, gentlemen, I am come to smell out my master here. Your kinsman John, sir, your kinsman John. Oh, he's brought the hundred pound. Uh, where is he? It appears by this the matter is of uh, less weight. What? More papers? Fellow, what hast thou brought me here? A recantation? It, it may, may be, be so. For, oh, sorry. It may be so, for he appears in a white sheet. Indeed, he seems sorry for his bad life. Bad life? Bad life, knave? What means all this? Master Dr. Noel, pray read it for me, and I'll read that my kinsman John hath sent. Where is he, knave? Your worship is no wiser than you should be, to keep any out of that coat. Uh, knave, thou meanest. Knave, I mean, sir, but your kinsman John, that by this time's well forward on his way. Any day, what have we here? Knavery as quick as eels. Will more of this? You were best let me help you hold it, sir. My knave, dost think I cannot hold a paper? Help will do no hurt, for if the knavery be as quick as an eel, it may chance to deceive you. <clears throat> I am a merchant made by chance, and lacking coin to venture, your hundred pounds gone toward France, your factors in the Compter. No, sir, he is yet but in the tavern at Compter Gate, but he shall soon be in, if you please. Away, knave, let me read on. My father gave me a portion, you keep away my due. I have paid myself a part to spend, here's a discharge for you. Precious coal, here's a knave round with me. Your factor Timothy T Thinbeard writes to you, who it seems is arrested at your suit. How at my suit? And here confesseth by using bad company, he is run behind hand 500 pounds and doth entreat you would be good to him. How? Run behind hand 500 pound and by bad company? Master yeah. Dean of Paul's. He is a fellow seems so pure of life, I durst have trusted him with all I had. Here is all so much under his own hand. Uh, let me see. Uh, who set you to arrest him? Why, your kinsman, John, your kinsman, John. <laughs> In faith, I smell the knavery then. This knave, belike, mistrusting of my kinsman, would come along to see the money given me. Mad Jack, having no trick to put him off, arrests him with a sergeant at my suit. There went my hundred pound away. This thin beard then, knowing himself to have played the knave with me and thinking I had arrested him indeed, confesseth all his tricks with yea and nay. So here's 500 pound come, one run away. Don't to me, Master Gresham. It's my man John gone away with your hundred pound. Faith, it appears so by the acquittance that I brought. Uh, no matter, Master Hobson. The charge you trust him with, I'll see he shall discharge. I know he is wild, yet I must tell you, I'll not see him sunk. And afore God, it hath done my heart more good the knave had wit to do so mad a trick than if he had profited me twice so much. He ever had the name of mad Jack Gresham. Uh, he's the more like his uncle, Sir Thomas Ramsay, when he, when I was young, I do remember well, <laughs> I was as very a knave as he is now. <laughs> uh, Sirrah, bring Thinbeard hither to me, and Sir Thomas Ramsay, your hundred pound, I'll see you paid myself. <laughs> Mad Jack, <laughs> gramercy for this flight, this hundred pounds makes me thy uncle right. Okay, so that was an interesting scene. We had a um, a tour of worthies in a gallery, interrupted by two messages and, and a rather surprising response to them, I thought. Uh, what do you guys make of that scene? 
too fast yeah, but... moving. <laughs> Lynn, is that a hand? Yeah. Um, yeah, the whole not rogues gallery of like, oh my God, that's tedious. I, I suppose it was interesting and instructive to the audience at the time, but you know, if you were gonna produce this today, I mean, editors, pruning shears, right? so boring, sorry. Um, and then, yeah, Alik, you said something about somewhat unexpected. Uh, Gresham does not respond to the news that his factor has been arrested. The, he figures it out awfully quickly for one thing, he gets it just right. And I'm not sure that, that that's right, <laughs> that a person with that little information would have been able to do that. And then he's like, oh, well, my nephew, he's such a wag. That didn't seem to be his attitude when we first met him. Alan. I, I must admit getting echoes of yesterday when I was thinking, you know, this, this is set among city, city spivs, you know, with no sense of honesty. You know, and Gresham has admitted as much that, oh, I was as bad as he was when I was young. It does sit a bit uncomfortably with the discursion uh, on virtue we've mm. just had. Civic <laughs> virtue, civic virtue. Ah, the young scamp. He's run away <laughs> with my money. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, did you have a hand raised? And then Lois. And I forgot to unmute. Um, yeah, um, the, the whole gallery thing, I was thinking... Yeah, this is totally where he got the material from his, like, you know, Lord Mary's shows. And also, it, I was like, he probably stole the idea from Dido. Uh, or I think it's from Dido, where, like, she, you know, um, there's this whole thing about, like, looking at the suitor's pictures or something. Um, and, um, yeah, it was just a bit like, look how much I know about these people, and you, you should do well to obey. And uh, it was a bit sort of weird. Um, also, Jack Gresham, well, John Gresham, uh, is a bit, reminding me a, a bit of Jack Sparrow, <laughs> the Pirates of the Caribbean, is <laughs> like, making it up as he goes along, thinking he's all that, but not really. Lois, you yeah. were saying something? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Haywood is doing quite a good uh, portrait of the, the city, uh, this mixture of... Uh, uh, slightly uh, shady dealings to make them rich and then the philanthropy that comes after it. Where else have we seen this? I mean, it's not that unusual. <laughs> yeah. And it's quite interesting. I mean, the way that example, I mean, there, there is a lot of uh, advice in this period about the importance of example rather than precept. And, the, and that's exactly what uh, the Dean is giving them by showing them these portraits. I mean, it's, it's partly just the fact that these people were famous enough to have their portraits and have them hanging in a gallery. I mean, the, the whole idea of a gallery in someone's house was that you kind of, you walked on a rainy day and imagined you were talking with your friends who were portrayed there or communing with these spirits of the ancestors who were portrayed there. And, uh, no, I think it really hits Gresham immediately, you know, oh, so these are pictures of people who did good. Hey, so I could be there if I worked on it, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure his heart is really in it, though, Eric. Um, yeah, also, it's kind of, um, they, they, they did good, but also they were very, very wealthy. I mean, like, one of them is a sheriff. Well, uh, most of them are sheriffs of London, or at least mayors of London. I don't know how much they got paid in terms of, like, whether they had, a, like, a stipend or a salary or something, but just, like, the status that came with that um, must have been sort of, a payment in and of itself, in, in a way. Yeah, status is important. I mean, the other thing is probably, I mean, if you're wondering about Gresham's attitude to his, to his nephew, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. I think this is pretty standard. I mean, uh, older guys liking to remember that they were wild in their youth as well. I mean, uh, you know, to avoid the, the obvious comparison. I mean, one could look a bit later at the School for Scandal, for example, if you remember. That's exactly what I was thinking of, is School yeah. for Scandal and Charles. Yeah, yeah exactly, and, yeah. And his yeah. uncle, you know, who, yeah. and he wouldn't sell my picture. You he know, wouldn't sell my picture, I've forgiven yeah. everything. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think it's, it's pretty standard that uh, uh, older guys quite like wild young men. And there's a standard view that wild young men will eventually be the best citizens when they sober up and all that. Yeah. Uh, Rachel and Bryony. 
Um, no, uh, we were talking about status yesterday and the clothing and all this other stuff. Um, and uh, Lois bringing up the portraits and how there's that sort of spiritual element and that if I'm good, maybe somebody will paint a portrait of me. Uh, even though there's no like mention of religion, I feel like there might be some social commentary in that, that the if he's good, he'll get into a portrait gallery as opposed to something, you know, more like heaven. You know, he'll get into this status thing instead of this moral uh, status place that, you know, people talk about in older plays and th that we've read. Well, it is the Dean of St. Paul's who's giving him this tour of, giving them this tour of worthies. Mm. So religion is there in a way. Bryony. Mm. Yeah, just um, because I noted yesterday, and it's continued today, this, this sort of business business, whereby this play is giving us some real insight into historical aspects of life, um, but I'm still questioning the, the entertainment value of that to an audience today. <laughs> I think that the gallery scene would be quite a hard sell, but I don't know, what could we do with it? Any thoughts about staging that? Uh, just flipping through an iPad, like, <laughs> look at these people, <laughs> aren't they cool? And the, 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 the equivalent would be probably, I know people, I don't really want to mention on camera. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure how stageable an iPad is, though. Mm. I'm thinking of something that makes it more accessible to the audience, not less. Mm. Reading the Wikipedia entry. Yeah. <laughs> right? Something like oh. that. Yeah. yeah I, I, it, you know, like I said, big editors printing shares. Um, <laughs> I mean, you could update it with living or recently dead citizens of whatever you know community you're producing this in whether it's the US or the UK it's like you know Bill Gates immunizes the Bill Gates Foundation immunizes more children every year than the World Health Organization Ooh. um but I wouldn't do that I wouldn't I wouldn't do that uh because I personally do not want to endorse a system that creates gazillionaires who are then under some kind of social or moral pressure to do good with their billions, but that's totally optional for them. You know, I don't, yeah, I don't want to say this is a good system where we have um, enormous wealth disparities, but we can count on the rich people to take care of the poor, pe poor people. I'm, I, I don't know I'm not, that the play can be said to be giving us a good system. It's just yeah. showing us a system. Yeah, but I, I wouldn't even because the characters on stage seem to be endorsing that system. No, uh, no. Yeah, but we've seen the same characters endorse corrupt business practices. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lois, was that a hand up? Uh, yeah, I think I think it would work better, really, uh, as it is. I mean, it's more interesting to for people to think, good heavens, they were doing that sort of thing then, too, you know, <laughs> rather than just be told we're doing it now, which they know anyway. Yeah. I tend to agree, but... Any further thoughts? Okay, shall we hit scene seven then? All right. Okay. I think we're in um, Hobson's shop, and in any case, enter John Tonicoat. I sure tis in this lane. I turned on the right hand coming from the stocks. Nay, though there was master careless, man careless, and all careless, I'll still be honest, John, and scorn to take any man's wear, but I'll pay them for it. I warrant they think me an arrant knave, for going away and not paying, and in my conscience the master cudgelled the men, and the men the master, and all about me, when, as I swear, I did it innocently. But, sure, this is the lane. There's the windmill, there's the dog's head in the pot, and here's the friar whipping the nun's ass. Tis hereabout, sure. Enter in the shop two of Hobson's folks, and opening up the shop. Come, fellow crack, have you sorted up those wares, marked them with 54? They must be packed up. I have done it! 
it's an hour ago. Have you sealed up my master's letter to his factor, John Gresham? It is at Dieppe in France to send him matches, but he must use them at Bristow Fair. I and the post received it two hours since. Sure, it is hereabout. The kennel was on my right hand, and I think in my conscience I shall never have the grace of God and good luck if I do not pay it. Foot, look here, look here. I know this is the shop by that same stretch halter. Oh, my masters, by your leave, good fellows. You are welcome, sir. You are welcome. Indeed, that's the common saying about London. If men bring money with them, oh, sir, money customers to us are well, are best welcome. You say well, so they should be. Come, turn o'er your books. I am come to pay this same ten pound. And we are ready to receive money. What might we call your name? Why, my name is John Goodfellow. I hope I am not ashamed of my name. Your kin are the most beholding unto you. Fellow crack, turn o'er the calendar and look for John Goodfellow. What comes it to? Ten pound. You will have no more wares with you, will you, sir? Nay, prithee, not too far. Let's pay for the old before we talk of any new. John Goodfellow? Fellow nimble chaps, here's no such name in all our book. I think thou art mop-eyed this morning. Give me the book. Letter I, letter I, letter I. Oh, when had you your wear? I had it some ten days ago. Your name's John Goodfellow, you say? Letter I, letter I, letter I. You do not come to mock us, do you? I, letter I, letter I, letter I. But this, by this hand, if I thought you did, I would knock you about the ears afore we parted. Fellow crack, you get me a cudgel ready. Letter I, letter I, letter I. But here's no such name in all our book. Do you hear, fellow, are you drunk this morning to make us look for moonshine in the water? But art not thou drunk this morning, canst not receive the money that's due to thee? I tell thee, I had ten pounds worth of wear here. And I tell thee, John Goodfellow, here's no such name in our book, nor no such wear delivered. God's precious, there's a jest indeed. So a man may be sworn out of himself. Had I not ten pounds of worth of wear here? No, good man goose that you had not. Hey, da. his excellent fellows are able to make their master's hair grow through his hood in a month. They can not only carelessly deliver away his wear, but also they will not take money for it when it comes. Do you hear, Hoy, then? And my master were not in the next room, I'd knock you about the ears for playing the knave with us, ere you parted. I think your master had more need, if he looked well about him, to knock you for playing the jacks with him. There's your ten pounds, tell it out with a onion, and take it for your pains. Foot, here's a mad slave indeed, will give us ten pound in spite of our teeth. Imble chaps, alas, let the poor fellow alone, it appears he is besides him. Mass, I think you will sooner make your master stark mad if you play thus with everybody. Enter old Hobson. Hey there, bones of me, here's lazy knaves. Past eight o'clock and neither ware sorted nor shop swept. Good morrow to you, sir. Have you any more stomach to receive money than your men have this morning? Money is welcome, Chaffer. Welcome, good friend. Welcome, good friend. Here's Monsieur Malapere. Your man scorns to receive it. How knaves? Think scorn to receive my money? Bones of me, grown proud. Proud knaves, proud. I hope we know, sir, you do not use to bring up your servants to receive money unless it is due unto you. No, bones of me, knaves, not for a million. Friend, come you to pay me money? For what? For what? For what come you to pay me money? Why, sir, for where I had some month ago, being pins, points, and laces, poting sticks for young wives and for young wenches glasses, where of all sorts, which I bore at my back to sell where I come, with what do you lack? What do you lack? What do you lack? 
Owns of me a merry knave. What's thy name? My name, sir, is John Goodfellow, an honest poor peddler of Kent. And had ten pound and where of me a month ago. Oh, just give me the book. John Goodfellow of Kent. Oh, sir, nomine et natura, by name and nature. I am as well known for a good fellow in Kent as your city sum Sumner's known for a knave. Come, sir, will you be telling? Tell me no tellings. Bones of me, there's no such matter. Away, knave, away. Thou ask me none. Out of my doors. How owe you none, say you? This is but a trick to try my honesty now. There's a groat. Go drink a pint of sack. Comfort thyself. Thou art not well in thy wits. God forbid, pay me ten pound not due to me. God, Dickens, here's a jest indeed. Master mad, men mad, and all mad, here's a mad household. Do you hear, Master Hobson, I do not greatly care to take your groat, and I care as little to spend it. Yet you shall know I am John, honest John, and will not be out facet of my honesty. Here I had ten pounds worth of wear, and I will pay for it. Nimble janks, call for help. Nibble chaps, don't tell me the man begins to rave. Master, I have found out one John Tawnycoat had ten pounds of worth of wear a month ago. Why, that's I, that's I. I was John Tawnycoat then, though I am John Greycoat now. Ah, oh, John Tawnycoat. Welcome, John Tawnycoat. Foot, do you think I'll be outfaced of my honesty? A stool for John Tawnycoat. Welcome, John Tawnycoat. Honest John Tawnycoat. Welcome, John Tawnycoat. Nay, I'll assure you, we were honest. All the generation of us, there it is to a doit. I warrant you, you need not tell it after me. But do you think I'll be outfaced of my honesty? Thou art honest, John. Honest John Tawnycoat. Having so honestly paid for this, sort of his pack straight, worth twenty pound. I'll trust thee, honest John. Hobson will trust thee. And any time the wear that thou dost lack, money or money not, I'll stuff thy pack. I thank you, Master Hobson. And this is the fruit of honesty. Enter a persuavant. By your leave, Master Hobson, I bring this favour to you. My royal mistress, Queen Elizabeth, hath sent to borrow a hundred pound of me. Now, bones of me. Queen, no Hobson. Queen, no Hobson. And send but for one hundred pound. Friend, come in. Come in, friend. Shall have two. Queen shall have two. If Queen no Hobson wants, her Hobson's purse must be free for her. She is England's nurse. Come in, good friend. Ha! Huh. Queen, no Hobson. Nay, come in, John. We'll dine together, too. Make up my pack and I'll along from you. Sing merrily on the way, points, pins, gloves and purses, poting sticks and black jet rings, cambrics, lawns and pretty things. Come, maids, and buy, my back doth crack. I have all that you want. What do you lack? What do you lack? I have lost my sound making thing. <laughs> there we go. Right. Well, that was fun. Uh, any thoughts on that scene? <laughs> Lynn, was that a hand? No. No. I... <laughs> no. Anyone? Lois and Alan. Uh, Lois and Alan, yeah. Uh, Lois, you're on mute. You're still on mute. Uh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating insight into bookkeeping methods in the 16th <laughs> century. Uh, as far as I can make out, they're all looking under the first name instead of the surname, which uh, is likely to make it take ages since everybody's name is John anyway. And of course, the John would be written with an I rather than a, a J probably. Um, but uh, it, it's still not absolutely clear why. Uh, I mean, there, there was confusion about surnames a lot. I mean, people uh, in the records, I'm sure Helen can say plenty about this. People often are so-and-so alias something else, and it doesn't mean they're criminals, but for some reason they have a number of different surnames. So I can see this would cause trouble, but 
it is a hilarious situation. I mean, this poor guy trying to pay them. It reminds me of experiences I've had, certainly with receipts and, uh, uh, you know, not terribly bright people in department stores and so on. <laughs> yeah, um, Alan. Yeah, my point was that it, I think Helen said when she pulled the, um, the script together, Tawny Coat's name actually changes scene by scene, depending on which colour coat he comes in. in. Ah. So I think it needs a stage direction at the top that actually says, enter John Tawny Coat wearing a grey coat. <laughs> um, but his surname was never actually given in the initial sequence when he was given the goods and left without, uh, without paying. No. And Hobson had actually said, well, what colour coat did he have? Oh, he had a tawny coat. Right, we'll put him down as tawny coat and we'll put first name is John. Yeah. I which explains that. the confusion with the bookkeeping. They weren't quite as dim about <laughs> accounting as they might appear. Yeah. I mean, I think they're being <laughs> funny, right? Because mm. the joke is you have a trouble demanding money from people and they don't want to pay. Here comes mm. somebody desperate <laughs> to yeah. pay the debt and yeah. they won't let him. Try, try dealing with a local authority. You get the same issue now. <laughs> <laughs> and also kind of coming from a place that uh, didn't really modernize its naming until the 20th century. I really recognize that. There are still, like in my mother's village in rural <laughs> Greece, there are still people who go by five or six different names. Yeah. So-and-so's son the butcher, um, husband of what's her face, you know, the redhead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if I were going to regularize speech prefixes, I'd call him Goodfellow, John Goodfellow. So uh, yeah. the, the, the tawny coat and the, the gray coat don't get attached to him in mm -hmm. the producer's mind. It, it's, that's for the audience to, to sort out yeah, I think you could, I was going to say you could call him John, but you can't. Gresham is the uh, is also mm. there is also a John Gresham. Yeah. How about the scene itself, like how it operates as a scene? Elizabeth's got her. Oh, I'm sorry, Elizabeth's got her hand up. Yeah, Hi. yeah. I was just going to say, like, is it me or was that mention of Queen Elizabeth quite titillating? It was like, oh wow, she's been mentioned. <laughs> um, finally. finally, she says. <laughs> um, but um, I think, like, is it me or is this very masculine, this play? Whereas the last one had kind of a nice balance of the masculine and the feminine. This one seems to be quite like, is this the word phallocentric? Um, yeah. It seems to be, oh, well, you know, it definitely has that whole money aspect and economy and politics, but it also is to do with like a masculine view of the world. That was something that came to mind. I agree. Um, I, I was instructed yesterday not to spend so much time going, but why isn't this play about Queen Elizabeth when <laughs> the first part was Princess Elizabeth? But I'm, I'm kind of with you, Elizabeth. It does feel like, oh, suddenly there she is. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Perhaps she might appear after all. Yeah. Uh, I'm presuming this is a tax of some kind. The hundred pounds for Queen Elizabeth? Yeah, Alan. Sorry, you. Have yeah, it it is the tax man cometh. Um, <laughs> it was it was. I think Helen obviously would have far more information as it's her period, but uh, it was the quote voluntary subscription asked for by the monarchy mm -hmm. whenever they were short of a quid or two. Mm -hmm. You know, fi find prosperous merchants and tap them up for money. Yeah, I. I, I haven't heard about this being a practice in Elizabeth's reign, but I but subsequent monarchs often basically strong armed loans from their uh, their wealthier uh, citizens, both aristocracy and and uh, the merchant class. Forced yeah. loan is the word we've been given in the chat. Sorry, Lois. Well, Helen's put in a reference to the forced loan of fifteen sixty nine to seventy. So. Oh, okay, so that did happen in Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric, is that a lifted hand? Yeah, I was just going to say that it, you kind of get the impression that this happens a lot, the whole thing of like, so like, you know, you, you, you borrowed money, but you, you, you didn't pay, 
but you you came back to pay the, the money that you owe and like sort of this confusion you get the impression that it's not a one-time thing um yeah i don't know maybe that's just me and the first five scenes were very much concerned with money going out and money owed so far these two scenes have been about money coming back yes yeah, um, I was quite interested in um, uh, the, we sort of said in the chat, the landmarks in London at this time that Tony <laughs> Kate talks about. Um, the dog's head in the park. I was wondering <laughs> what on earth that could be. Me. I mean, maybe it's, I mean, it's quite easy to assume they could just be like pub names or something, but mm. I have no idea yeah. um, at all. And then the fry whipping the nun's arse. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I want to know whether these were like whether these were known to audiences there must be i mean they couldn't just put that in there must be some <laughs> some references going on here yeah if anyone knows anything yeah. about that i i just assume that it might be in signs i mean um, yeah. you know every every shop and every every eating place had a had a signboard with some sort of picture and they often make sarcastic references to the quality of the art on these things and uh, uh you know, given that this is a post-Reformation period, that, that that last image of the friar and the nun certainly is an anti-Catholic one. Uh, so, it, and they probably, I, mean, I don't know if there still were any pubs like that around. I, mean, I would have thought that that would have had to be uh, jinxed at some point as, as just not suitable. But uh, uh, that's what I would guess, that he's, he's finding his way by looking at the different signs and the images on them. Okay, shall we move on to see Eric, Eric showing Eric's waving. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just going to say that it's interesting how these scenes seem like they can kind of stand alone compared to the, the action of the play. Like, you know, the whole Gresham thing is just like the only thing connecting them is Hobson and Gresham, like, like Hobson and Hobson's shop connects like the rest of it with the rest of the plot. Whereas, I don't know, it's just interesting <laughs> to think of that. There was something about the way that that text of the peddlers was written uh, and coming up against Hobson's two uh, employees. There was something very, um, I, I don't know how, it's not naturalistic exactly, but it really kind of focused in on the workings of the shop in a way that I thought was interesting. Yes, Alan. It, it's almost got the feeling of a bit of sitcom. Right, you know, it, and and the more I look at it, we're almost getting a, a like a sketch show, with just about enough continuing narrative to try and hold it in one, into one space. But certainly thematically linked as well as through. Yeah, the that, but but yeah. as, as Eric said, you you could take an awful lot of these sequences out, and and do them as standalone pieces. And I, and I think Tawny Coat is almost the the stand-up comic who's there to keep the groundlings amused with the occasional coarse gag, you know, his, his poking sticks and so on, and the uh, the pub names. Right. Uh, shall we move on to scene eight? Scene eight. Enter Gresham and Swordbearer. Our city's sword bearer and my very good friend. What? Have our honorable court of aldermen determined yet? Shall Gresham have a place to erect this worthy building to his name? May make the city speak of him forever? They are in earnest counsel, sir, about it. Be you my agent to and fro to them. I know your place and will be thankful to you. Tell them I wait here in the mayor's court. Uh, beneath, in the sheriff's court, my workmen wait, in number full and hundred. My frame is ready, all only stay their pleasure. Then, out of hand, up goes my work, a credit to the land. I shall be dutiful in your request. Do, good master swordbearer. Exit swordbearer. Now, when this work is raised, it shall be in the pleasure of my life to come and meet our merchants at their hour and see them in the greatest storm that is walk dry and in a work I raised for them. 
or fetch a turn within my upper walk, within which square I've ordered shops shall be of neat but necessariest trades in London, and in the richest sort being garnished out. It will do me good to see shops with fair wives sit to attend the profit of their husbands, young maids brought up, young men as prentices. Some shall prove masters and speak in Gresham's praise. In Gresham's work, we did our fortunes raise. For I dare say both country and the court for wares shall be beholden to this work. Enter sword bearer with Lord Mayor and sheriffs. Master Gresham, thus sends the Lord Mayor and the court of aldermen. Or rather come to bring the news ourselves. We have determined of a place for you in Cornhill, the delightful of this city, where you shall raise your frame. The city at their charge hath brought the houses to, hath bought the houses and the ground, and paid for both three thousand five hundred three and twenty pound. Order is given the houses shall be sold to any man will buy them and remove them. Which is already done, being fourscore households were sold at four hundred three score and eighteen pounds. The plot is also pla planned at the, at the city's charges. And we, in name of the whole citizens, do come to give you full possession of this, our purchase, whereon to build a berth, a place for merchants to assemble in at your own charges. Master Sheriff, I'll do it. And what I spend therein, I scorn to lose a day. Neglect is a sin. Where be my workmen? Enter workmen. Here, here, with trowel and tools ready at hand. Enter Dr. Noel and Hobson. Come, fellows, come. We have a frame made, and we have room to raise it. But, Master Dr. Noel and Master Hobson, we have your presence in a happy time. This 7th of June, we the first stone will lay of our new burse. Give us some bricks. Here's a brick. Here's a fair sovereign. Thus I begin. Be it hereafter told, I laid the first stone with a piece of gold. He that loves Gresham, follow him in this. The gold we lay, due to the workman, is. Oh, God bless Master Gresham. God bless Master Gresham. The Mayor of London, Master Gresham, follows you. Unto your first this second I do fit, and lay this piece of gold atop of it. So do the sheriffs of London after you. And bones of me, old Hobson will be won. Here, fellows, there's my gold. Give me a stone. God forbid a man of your credit should want stones. Is this the plot, sir, of your work in hand? The whole plot, both the form and fashion. In sooth, it will be a goodly edifice. Much art appears in it. In all my time, I have not seen a work in, of this neat form. What is this voltage for is fashioned here? A stowage for merchants' wear and strangers' goods, as either by exchange or other ways are vendable. Here is a middle round and a fair space. The round is grated and the space seems open. Your conceit for that? Uh, the grates give light unto the cellarage, uh, upon the which I'll have my friends to walk when heaven gives comfortable rain unto the earth. For that I will have covered. So it appears. Uh, this space that hides not heaven from us shall be so still. Uh, my reason is there's summer's heat as well as winter's cold. And I allow, and here's my reason for it, uh, tis better to be bleached by winter's breath than to be stifled up with summer's heat. In cold weather, walk dry and thick together, and every honest man warm one another. In summer then, when too much heat offends, take air a God's name, merchants or my friends. And what part of this that is that is overhead? Ah, uh, Master Dean, in this there is more wear than in all the rest. Here, like a parish for good citizens and their fair wives to dwell in, 
I'll have shops where every day they shall become themselves in neat attire, that when our courtiers shall come in trains to trace old Gresham's birth, they shall have such a girdle of chaste eyes and such a globe of beauty round about, ladies shall blush to turn their vizards off, and courtiers swear they lied when they did scoff. Kind Master Gresham, this same work of yours will be a tomb for you after your death the benefits of tradesmen and a place where merchants meet their traffic to maintain, where neither cold shall hurt them, ni heat, nor rain. No, oh, Master Noel, I did not forget the troublesome storm we had in Lombard Street. That time Sir Thomas and I were adversaries, and you and Master Hobson made us friends. I then did say, and now I'll keep my word, I saw a want, and I would help afford. Nor is my present promise given you when you showed that rank of charitable men to us that I would follow their good actions forgot in me. But that before I die, the world shall see I'll leave like memory. A blazing star. <laughs> oh, God, my lord, have you heard, beheld this like? Look how it streaks. What do you think of it? It is a strange comet, Master Hobson. My time, to my remembrance, hath not seen a sight so wonderful. Master Dr. Nowell, to judge of these things you experience exceedeth ours. What do you hold of it? For I have heard that meteors in the air of lesser form, less wonderful than these, rather foretell of dangers imminent than flatter us with future happiness. And the arts may discourse of men of these things. None can judge directly of the will of heaven in this, and by discourse thus far I hold of it. But this strange star appearing in the north, and in the constellation of Cassiope, which with three fixed stars commixed to it, doth make a figure geometrical, lozenge-wise, called of the learned rhombus, conducted with the hourly mood of heaven and never altered from the fixed sphere, for it tells such alteration uh, that, my friends, heaven grant with this for a sight our sorrow ends. God's will be done, Master Dame. Hat what will. Death does not fear the good man, but the ill. Well said, Master Hobson. Let's live today that if death come tomorrow, he's rather messenger of joy than sorrow. Enter a factor. Ah, now, sir, what news from Barbary? Unwelcome you, sir. The king of Barbary is slain. Ah, slain by treason or by war? By war in that renowned battle. Swift fame desires to carry through the world the battle of Alcazar, wherein two kings, besides the king of Barbary, were slain. Kings of Morocco and of Portugal, with Stukely, that renowned Englishman that had a spirit equal with a king, made fellow with these kings in warlike strife honoured his country and concluded life. Mm, cold news, by our lady. Uh, the venture, gentlemen, of three score thousand pounds with that dead king lies in a hazard to be won or lost. In what a state consists the kingdom now? In peace, and the succeeding happy heir was crowned then king when I took ship from thence. To that king, then, be messenger from us and by the sound of trumpets summon him, say that thy master and a London merchant craves due performance of such covenants confirmed by the late king unto ourself, that for the sum of threescore thousand pound, the traffic of his sugars should be mine. If he refuse the former bargain made, then freely claim the money that we lent say that our coin did stead the former king. If he be kind, we have as much for him. I married the married god. It's a dangerous day. Three kings beside young Stukely slain. I tell you, my Lord Mayor, what I have seen, when sword and bucklers were in question, I've seen that Stukely beat a street before him. He was so familiar grown in every month, mouth, that if it happened only fight, fighting were, the question straight was, was not Stukely there? <laughs> Answer me, he would hear it. Now, what news with you? Enter a boy. Here's a letter, 
here's a letter sent you from John Gresham. Oh, an answer of a letter that I sent to send me matches against Bristow Fair if the, any if then any cat were come. I cannot tell, sir, well what to call it, but instead of matches of wear, when you read your letter, I believe you will find your factor hath matched you. What's here? What's here? As near as I could guess at your meaning, I've laboured to furnish you and have sent you two thousand pounds worth of match. How, Bones Knave, two thousand pounds worth of match? Faith, Master, never chafe at it, for if you cannot put it away for match, it may be the hangman will buy you some of it for halters. Bones of me, I sent for matches of wear, fellows, of wear. And match being a kind of wear, I think your factor hath matched you. The blazing star did not appear for nothing. I sent to be sorted with matches of wear, and he hath sent me naught but a commodity of match, and in a time when there's no vent for it. Do you think on it, gentlemen? I little thought Jack would have served me so. <laughs> Nay, Master Hobson, I grieve not at Jack's cross. My doubt is more, and yet I laugh at loss. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was that was interesting. We had uh, almost a a biopic there <laughs> about Gresham's <laughs> uh, bourse that he's building, mm. uh, and then the interruption with with bad news which again is weirdly received <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah sorry lynn so what is this like early modern gentrification we're like displacing a whole bunch of families in order to build a shopping mall <laughs> um okay and, and just somebody enlighten me about what this match said we can't be talking about matches mm. like little match what what's going on yeah. i don't know does anybody know what matches of where yes. are Ah, <laughs> Helen. Right, match. I think um, Helen. I think put in the the chat. Mm -hmm. It's actually the match that the slow match that was used for lighting flintlock uh, for lighting matchlock um, weaponry. So it's slow burning string. Mm -hmm. um, hence also the reference the hangman mm -hmm. because it, okay. the string could be made mm -hmm. into halters mm -hmm. or nooses. Um, the building that. Gresham is shown as erecting here is the Royal Exchange, which still exists oh, right sure. in the centre of London. Yeah. Um, and there were elements of gentrification to it, but that's, you know, a situation normal for any city that effectively the poor will get displaced to build facilities for the wet better off. Um, yeah. Now, there's also an interesting question about this comet and whether um, there is an appearance of Halley's Comet or one of the other major periodic ones at this time. Uh, but what struck me was the number of plays that we've read over the last number of months, which have actually been referred to in here. We've had Alcazar, we've had Stukeley, mm -hmm. uh, we've had uh, Thomas Woodstock, um, we've had the whole Peasants' Revolt, Jack Straw, What Tyler stuff brought in. So uh, I'm, I'm getting an impression that Haywood was actually doing quite a major cut and paste job on <laughs> other stuff that was kicking around in the repertoire at the time. Of, oh, well, people will remember that one. I'll stick a reference into it. Well, maybe it's even we'll have that later this season. Mm. So mm. Yeah. Could be coming next week. To a theatre near you. <laughs> uh, just as regards the Royal Exchange, the printer obviously considered this an important part of the play because in the, the full title we have, if you know not me, you know nobody, the second part, with the building of the Royal Exchange. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I'm not quite clear what kind of match it was that Hobson was expecting to yeah. receive, though. Uh, was it match in the match in the sense of like for like? You yeah. know, in other words, a match to what I already have. Mm. Yeah, it's it's not clear in there. He keeps okay, saying matches of okay, wear. Okay, okay, hang on. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the divine voice of Helen. I will read from the chat. Matches are small pieces of cord, cloth, paper, or wood, which have been dipped in melted sulfur and can be used with flint to light things, a candle, a lamp, or to light fuel or wicks of candles in lamps. They were small items, readily sellable. Mm -hmm. Match was a length of wick which could come, which could be sold by the mile. It was <laughs> enormous. Reels of it would be supplied to armies. Uh, slow match, which was required for setting off um, both handheld firearms with matchlocks and also for setting off cannon. So what he's saying in 77 is, which we can date by the Great Comet, um, that nobody is going to buy match from him, but all households need a supply of matches. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will now mute myself. <laughs> So do we think that John did this on purpose? Probably. <laughs> I mean, it sounds like his idea of a joke. He, he seems to be just trying to make himself as much of a nuisance as possible. I think he wants to get back to England, doesn't he? And so he's trying to make us a, a mess of everything in France. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. And also we have news of the sugar monopoly that Gresham was trying to start in... Um, mm in scene one so that's that's interesting again i get this very biopic sense that it's partly the story of the greatness of gresham mm. and and around it i know mm. we've we've said that hobson is the connecting link but well onward we go yeah. i suppose <laughs> anyone have anything else to add before we go on to scene nine? Uh, oh elizabeth I think it's interesting that the had I think it's the King of Portingal, the King of Morocco, and the King of Barbary are all slain. Yeah. I think what are the chances? I don't know if this has um its basis in history. Oh, it does. Or, that's why that's why it was so famous, the Battle of Alcazar. Mm. Yeah. Which we've read. Yeah. No, there, there must have been very few battles where that happened. I mean, uh, so yeah. many rulers were either killed or died. Uh, because I think one of them just, if I remember rightly, just sort of dies during the battle. Wasn't even killed by the battle. He just died. Yeah, yeah I think so. Wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> was, was the Battle of Alcazar the one with the sort of, where they brought in the body to sort of, you know, um, you know keep the morale of the troops up yep. and stuff. yeah okay That's yeah one. yeah it's it's the one with lines like well it not exactly feed and be fat my fair calipolis but somebody comes in waving a, a lion's heart around and you know things like that i remember that yeah 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 you would <laughs> <laughs> it was a very very famous scene apparently because it gets referred to <laughs> rachel what is the Royal Exchange? Is it a... It's a building. Um, yeah, if you, if you come to London someday, as I hope you will, uh, it's very near the Bank of England. It's a very impressive building. In fact, people usually think it is the Bank of England. Uh, it's got a big portico with columns. It looks very much like a lot of the buildings in Washington, DC, which isn't surprising since they're all imitating that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, and at the moment, it's, full, it's got some quite expensive shops in it. So it's still kind of what... Uh, Gresham had in mind, I think. Uh, it was something like uh, a proto stock exchange. It was the place where merchants met to discuss goods and exchange money. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know how familiar you are with um, Dickens, but, but it, it, uh, Dickens mentions it in A Christmas Carol. Scrooge's name was good upon change um, for anything he cared to set his hand to, change being short for the exchange. So in the in the 19th century, even still, it was a place where businessmen met to make deals. So a little, a, a kind of proto Wall Street. 
There yeah, are there royal might... exchanges or corn exchanges mm. in, in a lot of cities in England. There's the one in Manchester has been turned into a theater. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's one in Leicester. Mm. Uh, well, there's also, uh, you get references later to the new exchange. I think there's a play of Broom called the new exchange. I think there may have been several of them eventually. Mm. Yep. Oh, Alan, <coughs> Alan, have you got your hand up? You no, I'm, I'm smoking, but I put in the chat, you know, that within the exchange, as has been set out, basically the ground floor will be the merchants who will be trading in, in sugar or wheat or whatever other commodities were about. The upper floors were divided into shops which were selling luxury goods, um, and were partly aimed at the wives of the uh, mm -hmm. the merchants. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say that this play isn't exactly a, a big puffing of Gresham so much as just the city, you know, mm. depicting the city in, in full uh, action and uh, excitement in a way. And, uh, you know, working against some of the plays which satirize them. I mean, there is that reference to uh, courtiers are going to come and see all these beautiful city wives sitting in their, their shops, which is certainly what they were supposed to be doing. Uh, and, uh, and, and the women, the ladies will be ashamed even to take their masks off because these ladies are so much more beautiful. Uh, I mean, if you read something like um, Eastward Ho, where the, everybody's so snooty about the city or uh, or the, there's a real kind of conflict between the, the woman who wants to get out of it as fast as possible and despises the city. And then people saying, no, no, the city is a great place. And this is where we made our money after all. I mean, it, this, this is a very pro city play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move us on to scene nine, enter two lords. You have traveled, sir. How do you like this building? Trust me, it is the godliest thing I've ever seen. England affords none such. Nor Christendom, I might say. All the world has not his fellow. I have been in Turkey's great Constantinople. The merchants there meet in a goodly temple, but have no common birth. In Rome, but Rome's built after the manner of Frankfurt and Emden. There, where the greatest marts and meeting places of merchants are, have streets and penthouses, and, as I might compare them to themselves, like Lombard Street before this burst was built. Enter Sir Thomas Ramsay. I have seen the like in Bristow. Good morrow to your honours. Thanks to my good Lord Mayor, we are gazing here on Master Gresham's work. I think you have not seen a goodlier frame. Not in my life. Yet I have been in Venice, in the Rialto there, called St. Mark's, tis but a bauble if compared to this. The nearest that which most resembles this is the great burst in Antwerp, yet not comparable either in height or wideness, the fair cellarage, or goodly shops above. Oh, my Lord Mayor, this Gresham hath much graced your city London. His fame will long outlive him. It is reported you, Sir Thomas Ramsay, are as rich as he. This should incite you to such noble works, to eternize you. <laughs> Your lordship pleases to be pleasant with me. I am the meanest of many men in this fair city. Master Gresham's fame draws me as a spectator amongst others to see his cost, but not compare with it. And it is cost indeed. But when? To fit these empty rooms about here, the pictures graven of all the English kings shall be set over and in order placed. How glorious will it then be? Admirable! These very pictures will surmount my wealth. But how will Master Gresham name this place? I heard my Lord of Leicester to the Queen highly commend this work, and she then promised to come in person and hear christen it. It cannot have a better godmother. This Gresham is a royal citizen. He feasts this day, the Russian ambassador. I am a bidden guest, where, if it please you? Good, Sir Thomas. We know what you would say. We are his guests, invited too. Yet in our way we took this wonder worth our pains. It is our way. 
to Bishopsgate, to Marsha Gresham's house. Thither, so please you, we'll associate you. Exempt. Right, so just as Lois was telling us that uh, aristocrats and the court would admire this building, bang come the aristocrats to tell <laughs> us how admirable it is. <laughs> yes, Bryony. What a scene of pure willy waving. <laughs> yep. Could have, you could have just said in two lines, and it was great. You know, <laughs> what, we did not need that scene. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on that scene? <laughs> yeah, I got pretty much sums it up. So, oh, Alan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, no uh, opportunity lost to diss the continent um, and effectively the rather negative uh, comments on Constantinople about slightly weird given the Grand Bazaar was probably by this time already several hundred years old. <laughs> okay. well, he would have never been there. I mean, he's just uh, uh, yeah. talking, talking up London. You know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the standard europhobe or english exceptionalism well i'm not yeah. even sure it's that it's more wow look here in our yeah. city something mm. more glorious than in other famous places mm. yeah <laughs> no i think it's meant you know to really be really pleasing to a london audience watching it which is what it's geared to <laughs> yeah. okay shall we go on to scene 10. <laughs> 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 Enter Master Gresham, leading in ambassador. Music and a banquet served in. The ambassador's set. Enter Sir Thomas Ramsay, the two lords, my lady Ramsay, the waits in sergeant's, sergeant's gowns with one interpreter. Lords, all at once, welcome. Welcome at once. You come to my new building's upfitting. It hath been long in labor, now delivered, and up. Anon will have a health to it. Uh, this uh, Russian prince, the emperor's ambassador, doth not our language understand. Um, interpreter, say that we bid him welcome. The prince speaks Latin, and in that language we'll interpret for him. <laughs> Salutum tibi opta, says uh, Adventum tum gravissime iste londinensis. Istum libens audio ages illi meo nomine ex animo gratias, funde quod vivamus. He gladly thanks you for his royal welcome and drinks to you. Yeah, we understand that sign. Come, let our full crown cups o'erflow with wine. Welcome again, fair lords. Thanks, Master Gresham. We have been viewing of your works. My verse. <laughs> How do you like it, Lords? <laughs> it's a pretty bauble. <laughs> Tis a fair work. Her Majesty intends to name the place. <laughs> she doth her servant Gresham too much grace. It will be pretty when my pictures come to fill those empty rooms. If that hold, that ship's worth fraught, rich fraught is worth her weight in gold. It will be rare and famous. Uh, what was it that the Russian whispered? He asked uh, me what interpreter the queen would in his embassy employ. None, tell him none. Why, for though a woman, she is a rare linguist. Where other princes use interpreters, she, propria voce, <laughs> I have some Latin too, uh, she of herself answers them without interpreter both Spanish, Latin, French, and Greek, Dutch, and Italian. So let him know. <laughs> my Lord of Leicester sent me word last night, and I am prouder on than on my building. The queen, to grace me and my works the more, the several ambassadors there will hear, and them in person answer. Enter a gentleman whispering to Sir Thomas Ramsay. <laughs> The Russian with the French. Uh, what would that gentleman, Sir Thomas? He is the merchant and a jeweller. Stardust of stones, he faith, he had a, hath a pearl. Orient and round, where so many carrots that he can scarce be valued. 
the French king and many other dukes have for the riches and price refused to buy it, how he comes to offer it to this ambassador. Oh, show him the pearl interpreter, the, the Lord Ambassador. Uh, mercador su, uh, quidam et aurifex spectandum tibi profert gemamam domine serenissimo. Et pulcra, et principi digna, et interroga, quanti viducat. Uh, he commends it to be both rich and fair and desires to know how you value it. Merchant? Who's the merchant? Hmm. I, don't <laughs> I don't think anyone was cast as the merchant. Right. Uh, I, I think it's a one liner. <laughs> My <laughs> price, sir, is fifteen hundred pound. Quanti vale? Uh, mille quin quingentis minis. Non, non, nimis pecara estista gemma. <laughs> he he saith it is too dear. He will not buy it. Um, I will peruse your pearl. Is that the price? I cannot bait one crown and gain by it. Enter a mariner. We will not be accessory to your loss, and yet considering all things, some may think us to be but bare of treasure at this time, having dispersed so much about our works. Yet if our ships and trade in Barbary hold current, we are well. Uh, what news from sea? How stands my ships? Your ships, in which the king's pictures were, from brute unto our Queen Elizabeth, drawn in white marble by a storm at sea, is wrecked and lost. Uh, the loss, uh, I weigh not this, only it grieves me that my famous building shall want so rich and fair an ornament. It touches all the city, for those pictures had doubly graced this royal edifice. Methinks the ships lost most should trouble you. Oh, my ships, but wealth, why, we have wealth. The pictures were the grace of my new births, so I might them in their true form behold. I cared not to have lost their weights in gold. Noble citizen. Enter a factor. Ah, our factor. Uh, what good news from Barbary? Uh, what says the king? Speak, didst thou summon him, or hast thou brought my threescore thousand pound, or shall I have the sugars at that rate? If so, new marble pictures will have wrought, and an, in a new ship from beyond sea brought. The king that in the regal chair succeeds the late king late dead, I summoned and demanded either your money tendered or the sugars after the rate proposed. He denied both, alleging, though he was successive heir, he was not, therefore, either tied to pay the late king's debts, nor yet to stand unto unnecessary bargains, notwithstanding. To gratify your love, the king hath sent you as presents, not as satisfaction, a costly dagger and a pair of slippers. And there's all for your threescore thousand pound. Oh, by our lady, a dear bargain. I fear me this will plague him. A strange cross. How will he take this news? Loss upon loss. Nay, will it not undo him? Doth he not wish his buildings in his purse? Hmm. A dagger? Hmm. That's well. Um, a pair of slippers? Hmm. Come, un undo my shoes. But uh, 60,000 pound in sterling money and paid me all in slippers. Then, oh boys, play! On slippers I'll dance all my care away. Ah, fit, fit! He had the just length of my foot. You may report, lords, when you come to court, you, Gresham, saw a pair of slippers wear, cost 30,000 pound. Somewhat too dear. Not nor yet, for all this treasure we have lost, repents it us one penny of our cost. As well in his virtues as his buildings. These losses would have killed me. Uh, jeweler, let's see thy pearl. Go 
pound it in a mortar, beat it to powder, then return it me. <laughs> what dukes and lords and these ambassadors have even before our face refused to purchase as of too high a price to venture on, Gresham, a London merchant, here will buy. Huh. Is it broken small? Fill us some wine. Fuller, yet fuller, till the brim o'erflows. Here, 1,500 pound at one clap goes. Instead of sugar, Gresham drinks this pearl unto his queen and mistress. Pledge it, lords. Whoever saw a merchant bravely or fraught in dearer slippers, or a richer draught. You are an honour to all English merchants, as bountiful as rich, as charitable as rich, as renowned as any of all. I do not this as prodigal of my wealth, but rather to show how I esteem that loss which cannot be regained. A London merchant thus treads on a king's present. Jeweller, my factor shall deliver you the money, and lords, uh, so please you but to see my school of the seven learned liberal sciences which I have founded here near Bishopsgate, uh, I will conduct you. I will make it, lords, an university within itself and give it from my revenues maintenance. We're not like those that are not liberal till they be dying. What we mean to give, we will bestow and see done whilst we live. Attendants come, the ambassador, guests, all. Your welcome's great, albeit your cheers but small. Okay. Wow. Yeah. What? What? <laughs> what? Conspicuous consumption, we call this. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Lynn. Am I the only one who th uh, who thought when he's like, oh, your ship is wrecked. Oh, well, like, I mean, I'm really glad that you can tolerate the financial loss, but there were people aboard that ship who are dead now. What the hell? He needs to get another one. <laughs> That's all he thinks of. It's like, I need to get another one with the marble in it. Bring it from across the sea. Uh, Brian, Ethan, Rachel. This whole place seems to be concerned with with things being valued wrongly, and I mean it's all it's all very financial, everything. But like, I don't know. Like he, he's talked about this school that he's built. As a side note, after he's been, we've had an entire scene bragging about how amazing this bloody exchange is, but actually the good thing that he did is just mentioned as an aside and you know it just and and the sixty thousand pound slippers really but he's cool with that well i, I don't know it's, it's doing well he didn't thing. pay sixty thousand for the slippers that's just it's all he got for uh, the yeah. money that he was supposed to be getting sugar for <laughs> yeah rachel uh no, uh, I don't know. This scene reminds me of like, is maybe I'm starting to get an idea what this is. I mean, it's about the money and it's about the status and it's these things, but I wonder if it's supposed to be for the audience of the time, something like uh, a Wolf of Wall Street or, um, you know, some of those movies that Christian Bale was in uh, where he was playing um, a guy who, uh, called to the housing crisis, made a bet on the housing crisis in like 2007, 2008, or um, uh, that movie Steve Carell was in these. Uh, and the focus on the, the money of the ship instead of the people, that that is always the focus for this group of people. And I wonder if this is a scene that is meant to, um, uh, you know, just show how undervalued things are uh and how overvalued other things are that this man can just grind up pearls and drink them um you know it's almost like in um music videos how they used to pop like the all the bottles the top shelf 
alcohol Just, uh, things like that. I, yeah, I think it'll certainly be hard for a, a contemporary audience to see for an audience now to see as anything rather than satire on wealth. I don't know that we can say that that's what it intends. Uh, Alan. Yeah, I mean, it, it again, I'm getting flashbacks to the pictures from the 80s of the the, the Canary Wharf traders, to give them a polite term, you know, ba basically going out and snort, snorting large quantities of uh, cocaine, of uh, Colombian marching powder and drinking the most expensive booze, you know, and basically showing the hell off. Uh, Lois. Yeah, um, but the, uh, well, one thing is that Gresham is imitating Cleopatra. I mean, there's a story mm -hmm. of Cleopatra, I think, drinking a, uh, a powder of pearl in a in a cup, drinking to Antony, and this being an example of uh, you know the the lifestyle in uh, Egypt. And uh, I mean, I think there it was regarded as decadence. Here, I don't know. I mean, there's what, what's so weird about it is these people are all dealing with money and talking about money all the time. But at the same time, what Gresham is trying to show is that he's above all that. You know, that he actually doesn't care about money, and he is using it for all these good purposes. I mean, we still have Gresham College as well, and they still have a, an endowed series of lectures every year on all sorts of subjects. I mean, I've, I've seen pamphlets about it. Uh, so it is amazing. I mean, he, you know, he genuinely has done something that is still with us, both in terms of the building and in terms of the college and the education it provides and so on. And uh, I think that uh, it, there's this funny sort of double thing of the stress on material wealth and yet stress on how that's not the most important thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. The, the one thing about that is, is that I, I know there's all different people that would be coming to the theater at this time. And I mean, if you're somebody who's like in the ground section if you're just standing there in the pit then I feel that this type of thing would just hit differently because it's the paintings uh you know um it's the grinding up of things that you couldn't even afford and then just drinking them as if they were nothing and then uh you know all these other things I'll, also I think this one part that's interesting that Gresham says unto his queen and mistress uh there's no like common between those and so i wonder if you could play it either way of the you know queen being one person and his mistress being another or if he's insinuating and making a joke about the queen and referring to her as his mistress nope no, I nope think what mistress, is going on mistress is taken straight as in feminine equivalent of master mm -hmm. his boss his overlord mm -hmm. uh anyone else yeah, I mean, I, for me, I think the question is less how would how would the groundlings at the time have taken it and more how will a modern audience take it? It's very hard for us not to see Gresham's conspicuous consumption here as being like Elon Musk or mm -hmm. somebody like that, who is not a particularly beloved figure. Mm -hmm. And what do you do with that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see that the point might be civic pride. London is as great as Venice, as great as Constantinople, as great as wherever. But, but I, I don't know that that would fly for uh, us now. Well, I think it's not so much that, uh, not so much that people would share these views, but they would recognize that uh, that's all exactly the same now. I mean, there's still delighted, you know, if, if London brings off the Olympics or the celebrations for the millennium or whatever. I mean, you know, one does want the, those things to be spectacular. Uh, no, I think I think people would find this very interesting, just as an example of how, how you know, this many hundred years ago, people were still thinking in much the same way. Yeah. Uh, Eric. I find it interesting that suddenly Ramsey and Gresham are friends, uh, or at least on the surface, they're friends. Um, they're kind of like very, hey, old chap with each other, sort of, hey, hey, hello, oh, like sort of talking about their vice, their virtues, although it kind of feels like, you know, Ramsey is waiting for Gresham to fail. 
Well, I mean, we saw them agree to be friends, and I guess they're actually doing it. Alan? Yeah. I think it's probably uh, got something to do with the fact that uh, Gresham has got an awful lot of money and an awful lot of influence. <laughs> <laughs> or is that being very cynical? <laughs> Rachel, is that a a waved hand? Oh no, I'm um, entranced by Leo's cat, not Meg. That's all. Uh, so I'm also that. trying to see Leo. <laughs> oh, there is Leo's cat, not Meg. <gasps> yes. Right. This is now not forward. the feline appreciation society. Let's segue <laughs> into uh, final thoughts of the play so far. We've read ten scenes, about two thirds of the play. Anyone have anything they want to say? Elizabeth. Well, I'm still waiting for Queen Elizabeth to come in. <laughs> you know, I, I I still believe, I think that, you know, Bryony had a really good point when she talked about the willy waving. <laughs> it does have all these kind of an economic driven, financial, royal exchange driven text. It, it kind of gears itself towards the masculine. And Lady Ramsay's voice is just tiny. She's just, she's just tiny. She's just like, she's just almost disappeared. And I think she was the only lady in the text that was really like, you know, of, of prominent, of prominence. So I, I think that this play needs a little bit more of the feminine. Um, and part one had that. So we're not going to talk about part one, but it did have, it had a lot of the feminine. It did. Uh, anyone else for final thoughts, or do you want me to go around and call on you? Yeah, Bryony. Um, I am not feeling too sad that I'm not here for tomorrow's session, to be honest. It's very, it's very capitalist, which isn't really my bag. Like, I think, I think there's so much, there's a wealth of historical information in this play that you could workshop and, and as a group beyond Shakespeare can get a lot out of it. And I've enjoyed that. But as a play, I would not stay and watch the end if I was in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's, uh, do we have anybody who likes it then? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Lois. Well, I find I just find it very interesting, and uh, uh, and somehow Haywood's whole style of I don't know these kind of these sorts of conversations, and uh, he's obviously got tons of historical sources that he's assimilating and trying to work in, and uh, I don't know. I'm I'm just sort of impressed by by the way he puts it all together. I think we are going to get Queen Elizabeth in the next bit. I mean, she's been talked about so much. I think this is the climax that he's building up to. And uh, and actually that theory that it was the first play might be right because there is that sense that uh, uh, the audience would have been quite excited about the idea of seeing somebody representing the, the queen who after all was not that long dead and uh, yeah. uh, whom they'd never been allowed to see. Well, they'd seen loads of portraits of her, but portrait, how the portraits were done was very carefully regulated. I mean, she, at one point, I think, called in a lot of pictures that she thought were inaccurate. And there were sort of patterns that were sent to artists that they had to work from. So, uh, I mean, this would have been, I think, quite exciting for audiences. I think there is a reason why this play, which must have been, you know, billed as a play with Queen Elizabeth in it, is, is sort of built up to like this. <laughs> I'm really interested in some of the techniques that, that he's using. I noticed it particularly in the scene with John Tawnycoat trying to get his money back mm -hmm. uh, and how inside and outside and asides and public address are negotiated, I think is really interesting. Uh, Lynn, do you have any final thoughts? Um, Lois said something earlier about, you know, it's it's the, the play is saying money is important, but but only not that, and I and I have to say I don't think it's actually terribly successful at walking that line between um, uh, cash is king and no, actually nobility of spirit is what makes the, the cash. I mean, I I'm not buying what it's selling <laughs> to um, to use the the capitalist metaphor yeah this sort of him to capitalism 
uh, just not rubbing me the right way at all. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we're in a different age of capitalism now and we look on it differently. Yeah, uh, yeah. Eric, do you have any final thoughts? I was just thinking that, like, comparing the, well, obviously you can't really compare, but I mean, um, the comparing the way he's writing this to the golden age is a completely different style. It's almost like he's going, look, I can do funny. I can, I can. I honestly, <laughs> uh, but not, but like, right? it's kind of, I don't know. It's just interesting. Uh, sort of, I can do things that are relevant as well, you know? Um, yeah. I'm just wondering if he wrote the golden age before or after, but I can't remember. I think it's around the same time actually, which is kind of insane. Or at least, you know, when it's printed. Um, yeah. It's just interesting to look at the differences of style by the same person um, and sort of that kind of, although I guess additions and, uh, you know, subtractions might have been made by the printer as well. I suppose they're similar in that they're both pretty didactic. The Golden Age was what you needed to know about Greek mythology, and this is what you need to know about recent London history, maybe. There you go. It's just a guess. Uh, Alan, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to say I'm particularly enjoying it. It's, it's an interesting piece. And I could actually have seen some of the theatre companies that were around in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, I'm thinking someone like 784 Theatre Company, you know, the, the ones which were coming from a very determined left-wing perspective actually taking this as as a starting point for you know capitalism doesn't change its spots mm, exactly. okay uh rachel any final thoughts um i agree that it's this very masculine we, we're getting such a masculine um play uh i think this is also interesting, I think, um, not necessarily compared with its prequel, but with some of the other plays that we've done that it's so much, I, I think there's um, a lot of granular stuff going on and it's not as grand, but that there's, the, I, I think this could be something like when put together on a, in a, in a final thing or if run for time or whatever that, this could have you know more than maybe what we're seeing now um but yeah the, i don't know maybe it is the modern perspective that we're a little more sick of the sick of the um th that consumption um but also just the class system i guess not being as mobile at that time i think capitalism is as a, a people accept it more when that you you have more mobility to move up or down but if you don't have as much ability to move up or down i think that's when people get uh and start to look at that consumption not that that's how people looked at it then but that maybe they if you're not allowed to talk about it this is the way that you would say it and put it in this frame for people to you know praise it or tear it down uh for themselves Leo, do you have any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I think I didn't um, find it sort of, it wasn't mostly, I didn't find the um, uh, Gresham or his whole uh, lordly group um, enjoyable. I thought that, um, <laughs> I thought um, Woody Coat and uh, obviously, I mean, the sort of more comedic scenes that probably could have been taken out of the play um, and still been fun. Um, yeah. I thought they were more fun. But even still, it was it's sort of just interesting to sort of have a another like view of London. There seems to be quite it's it's very I mean they're all sort of London centric, but the fact that it's a comedy and it's sort of present day well it's <laughs> contemporary. So um, even so, I just find it interesting, but maybe I'm just, I don't know much about <laughs> London at the time. Yeah. 
Uh, Eric, do you th did did I miss something out that you think should have been mentioned? I I don't know. I'm getting paranoid about like what we've mentioned. Anyway, yeah. Sorry, I, I did have a separate point to make, but I mean, this recap. But yeah, go ahead, make a separate point. Um. Yeah, no, just thinking back to the discussion about the golden age. Well, technically, we realized that that was not the golden age. So technically, like, maybe this is not the the play about <laughs> capitalism that we think it is. Well, let's find out. Uh, it seems pretty concerned with various levels of, of mm. London's capitalist functioning. Mm. I, I'm not sure that it's inviting us to make a moral judgment the way we are. Mm. Um, but, but I think it would also be really hard for a modern audience to avoid. Uh, unless anyone has anything else to add, I think we're going to say goodbye then. I believe big cheesy waves are traditional. Thank <laughs> all the wonderful readers. <laughs> oh, it's not better that young couples say you raised us up than you were our decay.